I'm Alan Rupert, Director of Sales for JVC Professional Video. And next to me is Edgar Shane, General Manager of Engineering for JVC Professional Video. Hello, and welcome to our GUI LS300 webinar. As we go through, there is a chat window below, and you can ask questions. And at the end of the seminar, we will answer as many questions as we can. Uh, let's start with the GUI LS300. Uh, we're going to talk about features of the camera as well as the new firmware. So whenever a customer talks to me about purchasing a new camera or even renting a camera, one of the first things that they always ask about is the form factor of the camera, how it's going to affect them, and the sensor of the camera. So why don't we start there with the 300? Well, uh, GUI LS300 features compact handheld form factor, and it was equipped with the 4.5K Super 35 sensor and Micro Four Thirds mount. So a Super 35 sensor is a large sensor, and we have yes. the smaller MFT mount for the lens. <laughs> not really, not really. I will show you what it is. As you can see, Super 35 sensor is surrounded by Micro Four Thirds metal bayonet mount. Mount is not that small. It actually works very well with the Super 35 sensor. And what is important that uh, because of standard MFT mount, we can take advantage of this interface. You see this gold-plated contacts right. to provide communication with the lens. OK, so communication for the lens is important so that you can have feedback? Uh, the most important communication with the lens would be iris control. OK. Understood. And using electronic interface, now we can control iris of about any lens with a dedicated knob on the camera. Or if you switch camera to automatic mode, then iris will be controlled automatically to provide correct uh, exposure for the uh, video. OK, great. Um, I see a bunch of lenses here, um, but they all don't look like they're an MFT lens. That's right. Not all of them are. And uh, what is the beauty of MFT mount is that it features very shallow uh, lens uh, sensor placement. So sensor is actually very close to the to the bayonet, which means that you can very easily adopt MFT mount to about any other mount by using of simple extenders or adapters. Because most other mounts, including Canon, Nikon, OPL, the sensor is located much deeper okay. than MFT. And uh, what we have here in the studio today, we have this adapter which is a very good example. It's manufactured by Metabones. And this adapter adopts from a Micro Four Thirds mount to Canon EF. And as you can see, this adapter doesn't have any glass. It's a simple extender, but it's not actually that simple. It features built-in microprocessor, uh, which translates Micro Four Thirds commands, which come from the camera, into Canon EF commands, which is important to control Canon lenses. So when I mount this adapter on the camera, right. Um, and I also brought this 50 millimeter Canon EF lens. This is prime lens. I mount this lens to the adapter, and now we have Canon EF lens mounted to uh, GY LS300 with the help of uh, EF2 MFT adapter. That's great. So then we can also mount an MFT lens. We can mount uh, MFT lenses. We can mount many other lenses. But first, I'd like to show you the image from this lens uh, in, the, uh, in the viewfinder. And you can see the reason people use prime lenses right. is because they produce very nice uh, shallow depth of field. It gives that cinematic look. It looks that cinematic look. It allows you to highlight the main object. It kind of mimics your brain the way you think when you look at objects. Okay. That's what uh, this is called bouquet effect or blurred background. So once again, this is uh, Canon 50 millimeter prime, and you can see from the viewfinder information, we're shooting at f 1.4. We're shooting wide open, and image looks uh, very nice, and you have very nice bokeh effect. All right. So then the other lenses that we have here, um, this other one here looks like um, it's a longer lens than the 50 millimeter. All right. It's a longer lens, and um, this was Canon, and now we will um, look at this lens. This is standard Micro Four Thirds lens, which is manufactured by Olympus. OK. And since we have Micro Four Thirds mount, uh, naturally we can mount any Micro Four Two Micro Four Thirds lens. And that doesn't need an adapter because it's an MFT mount. Correct. 
So with a micro four thirds lens mounted, why would somebody use uh, MFT lenses? Uh, they're compact, they're lightweight. Many of them feature motorized zoom control and okay. autofocus, which allows pretty much to shoot with this camera a traditional video style, where you have these grip controls for the zoom, and okay. autofocus. With the micro four third lenses, you can shoot like if you were using, you know, fixed lens. So uh, this system. zoom control will actually operate the lens. This is correct. Yes, uh, and we can switch back to the viewfinder. I will show you how you can zoom with the rocker switch. You can see I'm pushing rocker switch, and I can zoom and in and out, just like if I was using traditional conventional video camera. That's the beauty of uh, micro four third lenses with a motorized zoom. Okay, understood. But I do see some vignetting here on the screen. Oh, absolutely. And the reason you see this vignetting is that micro four third lenses, many of them, are designed to be used with the micro four third sensor. Right. And Super 35 sensor here is much bigger than micro four third sensor. That's the reason you see vignetting. Okay. And that's where VSM function, which stands for variable scan mapping of this camera, comes actually very handy. I will show you now how we can cancel vignetting and start using this lens precisely with the correct size of the sensor. All right. So we go back into the menu. And in the system settings, in the record set, this is VSM, variable scan mapping. By default, we're reading information out from the complete 100% of the sensor. OK. But what I can do, in this case, obviously, we see vignetting. So we need to electronically reduce the size of the sensor. So what we do here, we go to the SM setting, and we dial it down, and we will see mark for micro four thirds MFT. Now that's MFT, I click Enter. And now we reduced readout area of the sensor just to read out from MFT size. And now you can see this lens is used in a correct way, like if it was mounted to micro for thirds uh, okay. camera. The vignetting is completely gone. Vignetting is gone. We're just using this lens in the right way. OK. So now all MFT lenses need to be set at 80% MFT with VSM. This is an interesting question. Um, not really. Okay. There is actually another uh, group of lenses which was introduced in the market not long ago. Uh, and a good example would be lenses manufactured by Rokinon, which uh, actually were designed to be used with the full-size sensors. Okay. But because of popularity of micro four thirds mount, they were adopted by their manufacturers to micro four thirds mount. So this lens, in fact, was designed for full-size sensor, Super okay. 35, but it has micro four third mount. And I will show you in a moment how we can mount this lens here. Notice there's no contacts on that lens. Well, this is traditional uh, cinema type lens with all manual controls. And now, uh, when we go back into the uh, into the menu settings, and I don't need to use um, VSM for MFT, I can go all the way up back to 100% sensor scan, Super 35. And you can see that this lens produces no vignetting. Okay. And even though it's equipped with a micro further mount, you can shoot using full size Super 35 sensor. This type of lens is a very good match to this camera because you don't need any adapters. All right. So VSM will help if there's a spe specific lens that needs to be adapted properly to the camera so that it can get the proper readout of the sensor. This is right. Many, even micro four third lenses, which were designed for micro four third sensor, the amount of vignetting will vary. Okay. And since we have a step by step adjustment for VSM, it will allow customer to adjust pretty much to any lens to cancel vignetting and shoot at the widest uh, angle and properly uh, frame their, their okay. shot. So we do have a lot of lens options then, obviously, that can yes. be put onto the camera. That's right. Therefore, is there some type of a chart that will tell us what the crop factor is when you're adding this lens or this manufacturer's lens with this different mount on it? This is a very good question. I'm asked this question quite often about crop factor. Uh, crop factor occurs when a uh, lens projects on the sensor, which is significantly smaller than the original sensor that lens was designed for. Okay. In case of using lenses designed for full-size Super 35 sensor, there's no crop factor. 
because sensor is to 35 and lenses are projecting precisely on the size of the sensor they were meant to be. In fact, if you take lens from um, FS7, F55 or Aria Alexa on the set, you take off Cinema Super 35 lens and put it on Joel S300, you will see the same exact angle of view in the viewfinder. There's no crop factor. So what you're telling me is this 50 millimeter lens will be a 50 millimeter lens when it's mounted on the camera. Uh, this is correct. However, when customers are used to shoot with the DSLRs, and especially something which is called full-frame DSLRs. Mm -hmm. uh, those sensors are much larger than Super 35 equipment. Okay. Uh, in regard to those sensors, the crop factor will be 1.5, just like any other Super 35 equipment on the market. Okay. We do have another uh, two items over here. Um, what do we have? Right. We have another adapter, and that is... That is also manufactured by, uh, by Metabones. This adapter uh, allows to mount lenses equipped with the PL. This is already positive lock mount. As you can see here, it's also uh, doesn't have any glass. You don't need any glass because sensor right. is right size. It doesn't have any contacts, just metal, because typical PL lenses, they don't have any uh, communication with the camera. So with a simple click like that, now you have PL mount. You can mount any PL lens. And like I said, angle of view will be exactly the same as on any other Super 35 camera. Okay. We didn't bring any uh, large PL lenses in the studio, but I have something interesting here to show you, Alan. Uh, I brought this uh, Super 16 lens. It features the same PL mount. Right. This lens is about perhaps 40 years old. <laughs> uh, let's, let's mount this lens on the camera and then see what happens. So now we mounted um, Super 16 lens on Super 35 sensor. Whoa. Uh, you have a little vignetting. <laughs> yeah, we have just a little vignetting. This is true. <laughs> and again, why? Because sensor for Super 16, or rather, rather not sensor, but film, Super 16 film frame is so much smaller, much smaller. than Super 35. Okay. All right, again. So can we fix this? Uh, guess what? We can fix it. Uh, we'll take advantage of variable scan mapping again. And we go into the menu settings here, into the system, and we could set to VSM. And here, what we will do, we'll actually dial it all the way down to Super 16. And you know, it looking at the circle, circle actually gives you the image circle, which is very important. I think I need to take it even one click down for that particular lens, because you know, okay. lenses vary one from another. Something like that. All right. And now wow. we're shooting uh, with a 40 years old Super 16 glass mounted <laughs> on GYLS 300 with the PL2 MFT adapter. This is quite incredible. It truly gives you a variety of lenses and allows you to be creative in your choice of glass, because glass is very important. All right, so this leads me to another question then. We have the large sensor, but now we're scaling it down for this lens here, the Super 16 lens. So are we still recording a 4K image then? Right. Uh, in case of scanning down from full Super 35 to micro four thirds, we still maintain 4K resolution. Okay. But when we go as small as Super 16, it's only uh, a little more than 1920 by 1080. So we will uh, let you record HD only. We don't like to oversample to maintain uh, pristine image quality at any setting. OK. So then we're talking about files then, or uh, resolution, so we know it can record in 4K and HD. What type of files and what about the media that it records to? Well, this camera records uh, 4K and HD. You can look at the side, it's labeled. It's a member of our 4K cam family. Okay. It records 4K at 24, 25, and 30p. And it also records HD at a variety of frame rates from uh, 24p to 60p. Uh, recording media is um, SDHC or SDXC cards. You can see this is a very small card. Uh, those are available today, I think, with the capacities up to 256 gigabytes. So, <laughs> so even in 4K mode, you can record hours and hours of footage. What is important here that we have two slots, which allows to record uh, simultaneously on two cards. 
So you always have backup copy of your footage, which is very important on the production set. Of course, you can also record in sequential mode, and you can even record different format on another card, which allows to have something which we call proxy, if you need to send information quickly as digital dailies back to the producer, back to the studio. All right. Let's discuss then uh, version 2.0. Now, we actually were able to send the camera with version 2.0 to a cinematographer, Fred Blurton, and he was able to evaluate it for us. So let's hear what Fred has to say. Hi, Fred Blurton here. If you remember uh, a while ago, I talked to you about the uh, GYLS 300 uh, from JVC, how much I like the camera and how wonderful it is. Well, you know, they've upped the game and they've come up with some new firmware upgrades. And I'm really excited about these. I mean, I was excited about the camera to start with, but these are amazing. And uh, they are firmware upgrades, so that means that if you already have one of these cameras, that uh, you know you can take advantage of uh, of these new upgrades. There's four in particular that I want to talk about a little bit. Um, along with all the other record options that this camera has, they've now included Cinema 2K and Cinema 4K. Um, for all you cinema guys out there, I'm sure that that'll make you happy. I think it's great. So now I have a lot of different options as far as records are concerned. The second thing that they've done is uh, they put a histogram in this camera. Now the histogram is something that really is useful, particularly in high contrast situations. It allows me to set exposures that tell me exactly how the sensor is recording that image. It gives me the opportunity to set the bias of exposure toward the high side, toward the low side, if I need to protect the whites or I want to dig into those shadows. This histogram gives me the opportunity to tell how that's exposing. Um, the third thing is totally unique. It's called Prime Zoom. Now, Prime Zoom is exactly what it sounds like. It is the ability to zoom with a prime lens. Now, the way that they do this is to utilize the extra size of the Super 35 sensor. Now, we're using a uh, 50 millimeter uh, Zeiss. It's a prime lens. Chris is pushing in right now. And as you see, the exposure holes, the focus holes, the quality of the lens holes. This really is, is a value. I mean, it gives us the opportunity to double the focal length of this lens. It gives us the ability to do a zoom while we're shooting. It actually gave me the opportunity, if I wanted to just stay with the prime, to push out and to assist in focus. Very, very handy. So Fred mentioned three features in particular about version 2.0 that I want to address. The first one is Cinema 4K and Cinema 2K. What exactly is that? Um, we added two more resolutions to the set of already um, many other resolutions which are available. And we added uh, something which is called DCI, Digital Cinema Initiative, DCI 4K and 2K. DCI 4K allows to record at 4096 by 2160. And DCI 2K allows to record at 2048 by 1080. Okay. What about the frame rates that we can record? Uh, those both DCI resolutions um, you can record at 24p even and also 23.98p. Okay. Um, we were talking earlier and you mentioned that we also have uh, 70 megabit per second recording. Um, what is that about? Standard bitrate for 4K recording uh, originally is 150 megabit. We added uh, 70 megabit to give actually more flexibility in terms of media choice. Because 70 megabit files can be recorded on SDHC media class 10, while 150 megabit require SDHC class U3. So class 10 is much more readily available and also files are more compact. Okay, so a 70 megabit file is smaller than a 150 megabit file. But what about image quality between the two? Well, 150 megabit is, gives you the absolutely best image quality. 70 megabit uh, is quite usable and acceptable, but again, the customer will choose what to use uh, depending on the workflow. All right. Fred also mentioned the histogram. Um, now I know of histogram as being a graph or a chart. And what does it do for the camera? Uh, this request uh, we heard several times uh, since introduction of this equipment, and the histogram is something which allows you to see distribution of luminance 
okay. within your frame in between, let's say, zero and 100% levels. And it's a very handy tool because it allows you to see if your uh, frame is properly exposed. Okay. And, um, Histogram uh, can be enabled in the um, shooting assist mode, and going back to the menu, I will show you how it works. Actually, in, it's in, the, in the LCD viewfinder mode, in the display settings, and that's where we can um, actually turn histogram on. And also, what is interesting, that uh, when, you, when a histogram is on, it, it shows you two markers, mm -hmm. the top and the bottom. We can actually select markers to be anything and it depends on the shooting style. When I shoot, I prefer to set top marker to 100% and lower marker to 0%. If I do so, it will give me complete distribution of my luminance within the total range of my signal, which kind of tells me, am I properly exposed or under or overexposed? Okay, now I'm more familiar with utilizing zebras for my exposure. Is this another way of handling exposure? Uh, it's a very similar concept, but visualization is different. Okay. And many people like histogram, others prefer zebra. Once again, you can choose either or depending on your shooting style. Any other tools that can help with exposure? Uh, we edit uh, spot meter. And there's nothing new about spot meter, but the way we implemented spot meter in GYLS300 is quite interesting. Uh, spot meter gives you a readout from the darkest and lightest areas of the frame. If you engage spot meter in the automatic mode, it will actually automatically find the darkest and the brightest areas of the picture, and will also give you numeric readout in the percentage of your total latitude. Okay. Excellent. So you have three ways of right. adjusting exposure. Well, not to forget our focus assist, which gives you pixel-to-pixel -pixel preview in LCD and viewfinder, even in 4K mode. That is okay. also, that's my favorite tool. Well, I think my favorite tool is going to be something that Fred just mentioned, which was the prime zoom. I think it's a really cool feature. Uh, can you explain it a little further? Oh, this is something which is completely unique to JVC at this point, and um, let's talk about prime zoom. Normally, you would zoom with zoom lenses, right? A lens like this, Olympus zoom lens, you zoom and it goes in and out, obviously. Traditionally, prime lenses, or what, what is it uh, they call prime lenses? Lenses with a fixed focal length. You, okay. can, you can't really zoom with the fixed focal lens lenses. And I put my favorite Canon 50 millimeter lens back on this camera, and like I said, this is a nice prime lens. It gives a very nice bouquet effect, everything else. I wish it could zoom. Right. Uh, guess what? Now we can. Uh, we can take advantage of our VSM function and uh, actually assign rocker switch on a camera instead of traditional zoom to VSM zoom. And I'll show you how we do it here. We'll go into the camera function. And you can see the grip zoom is by default traditional zoom, which okay. you can use with the micro for third lenses, which I equipped with the motorized zoom. Another option would be uh, focus. This is very interesting as well. You can actually adjust focus by <laughs> pushing this uh, grip zoom. But now what we will do, we'll switch it to VSMZ. Now I can use my zoom control on the camera to actually zoom in and out with a prime lens. Wow. It's nice and smooth. It's very nice. You can control speed by pushing it uh, on a grip zoom. And you can see you can zoom in and out. And we're doing it now with a prime 50 millimeter Canon lens. This is quite incredible, I think. So I'm noticing that we're maintaining everything in focus. Um, we are also keeping the exposure. None of that is changing. That's right. That's right. Everything stays in place since we're already focused and exposure is the same. And uh, bokeh effect is even magnified at the longer end yeah. because of uh, image magnification. It looks like it's enhanced. Yes. Excellent. So one of the other features uh, that customers have been requesting has been a log. And that's something else that Fred is going to talk about. And let's hear what he has to say about JVC's J-Log. JVC has added the ability to record J-Log. Now, for those of you that don't know what log is, um, very simplistic, 
It's the ability to record the signal before it goes through the internal processing of the camera. Shooting in a log mode allows us to take that image and make our creative decisions in post. We don't have the pressure of having to make a decision on site. We don't have to worry about having the proper monitor that's set up. We can record it as flat, take it into post, and make our creative decisions as far as how we want that image to look while we have time and the proper monitors to do it. So Fred explains J-Log, but Edgar, I want to hear in your own words, what is J-Log? Well, J-Log is just another gamma setting in the camera. We have standard gamma, which is ITU 709, and this is very important gamma because very often you need to maintain your gamma throughout the entire production. Okay. And ITU 709 is industry standard uh, worldwide. Uh, but J-Log is just another gamma setting. All right, so what does J-Log achieve? What does it accomplish? What does it give me? JLOG uh, allows you to preserve and record in a file a much wider dynamic range of the signal and wider gamut of the signal, including dark levels, mid-tones, and highlights. Okay, but Fred says that the image actually looks flat. Well, visually, when you look in the viewfinder or you look at the file, it looks flat. In fact, I will show you how it looks here. First of all, I need to show you how to uh, activate JLog. JLog would be in the camera process. Okay. And you can see that we have a lot of adjustments here for many, many aspects of the signal. But now we're interested in gamma. And like I said, standard gamma is ITU 709, cinema gamma. Right. And here is JLog. Uh, you can see that visually JLog looks uh, sort of washed out and flat. Yes but it allows you to capture uh, a complete uh, tonal gamut of signal, uh, much wider than standard gamma settings. Okay, so I have this flat image, and is that what's actually recorded onto the media cards then, a flatter image? This is correct, and looking at the um, charts, you can see the J-Log transfer characteristic is much shallower than traditional ITU 709, and that's what it makes it look flat. Okay. But in reality, you can capture much more range of signal, like I said, in dark, mid, and highlights. So you're capturing more information? Correct. Okay. So I have this flat image now on my media card. Right. What do I do with it then? Well, uh, you bring it into an LE system. Okay. And then uh, that's where this word comes, grading. You grade it. Okay. And grading is just adjustment of the levels and gamma, and you can do it in many ways, but you can use Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro okay. to do this adjustment. It's really uh, very, it's like processing film. It's, it's almost like you're colorizing it back from a flat image. Uh, correct, it just bring it to the, they call it looks. You, you just need to bring it back to the look which you had in mind okay. when you shot this video. So then I have a question for you. If I'm a camera operator and I'm looking at what I'm shooting here and I have a flat image. Is there any way I can, I don't know, what to emulate what it would look like after it's been graded? Yes, this is important for you to see image in a normal way when you're shooting. Uh, yes, we can, we can do that here and I will show you in the menu. That going to the LCD and viewfinder settings, you can actually enable one dimensional lookup table lot viewfinder. You won't see it here because it's not coming out on the video output, okay. but on the viewfinder and LCD, when you activate a uh, one-dimensional lot, you will see image like if it was already graded. All right, I understand now. Fred actually was able to take the camera out in his review and get footage. So let's hear from Fred and see the footage that he was able to capture. Uh, I took this camera to a carnival at night and uh, shot some footage in a situation where I had very high contrast, a lot of bright lights, colored lights, a lot of shadows, nighttime. Um, and I was really impressed with the performance of this camera. Uh, we're getting ready to take a look at the, uh, at the video and I'll sort of walk you through it as, uh, as we look at it. But the thing that I want to tell you is that everything that you're getting ready to see was shot with JLog. 
uh, color graded in uh, Premiere using Lumetri. Uh, and everything that we shot was using prime lenses. So uh, not only will you see some zooms in this, but you'll also see a situation where, you know, at times I didn't zoom, but I used the extended focal length to push this 135 lens out to about a 270. So let's take a look and I'll talk you through some of the images. Now right away you'll see the advantage of shooting log. Nice shadow detail, uh, highlights are holding. Uh, nice, nice color. Um, this was shot at night just before total darkness. This is a log file, what it looks like with no grading whatsoever. You see it's very flat, a little on the green side. Um, this is graded into black and white, which I love to do. Really gives a nice film-like look. Look at the shadow detail and the highlights. And oh, by the way, this shot was a push-in all the way with prime zoom with a 50 millimeter device. I love this shot. Detail everywhere. And this is what it looked like as far as the log is concerned. So you can make this color, you can make it black and white. Same kind of a thing, and then when we grade it into black and white, look how pretty it is. I just love this shot. Now this is all color corrected to the same correction, and I just uh, you know, did a little sequence of whack a mole. You see the out of focus highlights in the background, they really pop very nicely, you got bouquet. really blends, I think, beautifully. This also was sort of a, uh, an exercise in focus. And, uh, you know, if I had talent that was staying in one place or, you know, I already had the focus puller or what have you, that'd be one thing. But these people were moving all over the place. And it was just me and the camera. So, uh, you know, I was using the uh, focus assist situations that you can pull together with, uh, you know, with this uh, LS300 and, you know, <laughs> It wasn't that hard to do. I just love to look at this. Look at the look at the background out of focus. Uh, kind of pops. I mean, it just feels so nice. And this, of course, is graded. Um, you know, you can make it black and white. You can make it high contrast. You can, you know, crunch the blacks. I mean, look look at the detail way in the background. You know, every place you look, you've got some nice detail. Here, over on the right, there's not a lot of light on those people. And of course, I have to get some of those, uh, you know, neon looking shots of the rides and, uh, you know, against the, the black sky. And, you know, log gives you the opportunity to really pull some nice detail out of these shots. Also can work with the shutter to have longer than uh, the normal shutter speed. This I think was at uh, two times 360. And uh, you know, I just did a nice uh, white cross here because I loved it in color and I loved it in black and white as well. And I really couldn't decide which I liked the best. So I showed them both. And log gives you the opportunity to do that. Prime zoom, 50 millimeter pullback. This is a prime zoom also. This was a 135 broken on, which I had pushed all the way out. A little tech about the prime zoom. Um, it works by reducing the active scan of the sensor, which is uh, about 4.5K, to 1920 pin 80. And what that does, is it allows you to zoom in about 2.3 uh, times without affecting the quality, the f-stop, the focus, uh, any of that sort of thing. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. This is an example of uh, 135 pushed out to 270. A little tech with JLog too is um, it's actually a gamma setting which specifies the relationship between the input signal, uh, luminance range, and recorded signal. Uh, standard gamma is 709, is like I don't know 400% of the signal range, where the JLog actually gives you 800% of the input range. Uh, it increases the ability to uh, capture tonal gamut just like film.
Now here's a shot I really love, not because it's a great shot, but because it shows the long capabilities with the very bright lights in the back, low lights in the front, and the fact that it's ever-changing. So with that craziness, I was able to make a pretty decent shot out of this, um, even though it's an impossible lighting situation. Wow, Edgar, the footage was really amazing. Nice, very nice footage. I noticed two of the tools from version 2.0 in that footage. I saw the prime zoom mm -hmm. and obviously the J-Log. I think Fred used uh, more than that. Uh, he shot it at DCI 2K with the 422 color sampling, so he pretty much used the whole palette of new tools. <laughs> amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I was able to see more detail in the highlights and the shadows, right. and that's what J-Log is providing me. So therefore, I should just shoot in J-Log all the time? Uh, why not? If you have time to process, because remember, we're talking about production. That's where you shoot, and then you grade your footage, and that assumes that you have time to do so. That's why they don't do it in news. OK. All of these are very powerful tools for the GYLS 300. So let's see if we have any questions out there that we can answer. And first question uh, looks like it's coming from Chris. And he wants to know uh, about the version 2.0 software. Uh, when will it be available? Uh, how much is it? And uh, where does he have to send the camera to be upgraded? Hi, Chris. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, V2.0 firmware is already available. Uh, you go to the JVC website, to GY LS300 page, and you will find firmware in download section. Upgrade procedure is very simple. You don't really need to send it anywhere. You simply uh, download that file, copy it to the SD card, follow the attach procedure, and in about three, four minutes, your camera is upgraded to V2.0 firmware. And as any other firmware upgrade for our professional cameras, it's free of charge. OK. Uh, another question we have is, what is the ISO on the camera? The uh, ISO is uh, 400 at 0 dB. And when you're moving to, if you're switching to JLog, then base ISO becomes 800. OK. So um, the ISO is actually improved when we're going to JLog? Uh, right. It depends on the settings of the gamma correction, like I said. And for JLog, the optimized ISO is 800. OK. And another question we have is on dynamic range. How does JLog affect dynamic range? Uh, standard dynamic range in the ITU 799 gamma allows to capture up to 400% of the signal. When you switch camera to JLog 1, you can capture up to 800% of image signal. OK. Another question we have is on the connections. Uh, what kind of connectors are on the camera? Uh, on the camera, we have um, HDMI connector, which enables 4K output, but also HDSDI, which is 3G SDI, which can output up to 1080-60p. OK. Um, HDSDI and HDMI, is it? Excellent. This. OK. Uh, looks like that's about all the time we have for your questions. Um, we thank you very much for joining us. And this is Edgar, Shane, and Alan Rupert. Thanks again and goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.